Good evening, I'm Paul Hunter and this is The National. The Supreme Court lays out the nuts and bolts of indigenous rights when resource projects hang in the balance. Resource companies know they've got to engage really early. But they're not the only ones being schooled today. Donald Trump bars transgender people from the military. Do his reasons stand up to scrutiny? Another medal for swimming star Kylie Moss. I think the most important thing is to have fun with it all. Plus, this baby had life-saving surgery days before he was born. When he came out, he was pink and screaming, and it was just the most amazing sound. Every Canadian oil and gas project going forward will be affected by the decisions made at the Supreme Court today. Two Indigenous communities were fighting two different project approvals by the National Energy Board. Each ruling went a different way, but both came down to one key consideration. Susan Lunn explains. The Supreme Court had a clear message for the federal government today, properly consult with Indigenous groups or put resource project approvals at risk. A Norwegian consortium wanted to do seismic testing off the shores of Clyde River, a remote community in Nunavut. The Inuit were worried their search for oil would harm or kill marine life they depend on. The National Energy Board gave the project the green light. Today, the court ruled that decision was wrong. Joyful and happy, you know, we did it. You know, we've been fighting you know, over three years now. The court ruled that these consultations fell short, calling the inquiry misdirected. The NEB didn't consider the Inuit's treaty rights and didn't consider the impact of their proposed testing on those rights. Their lawyer says this sets a clear standard for how the federal government must engage with Indigenous groups, a relationship it describes as its top priority. The duty to consult Indigenous peoples must be taken seriously. Government cannot simply pay lip service to solemn constitutional obligations. It was a different story for another resource project. Enbridge applied to expand its pipeline Line 9 to move heavy crude from Ontario to Quebec, triggering widespread protests. The Chippewas of the Thames First Nation was worried about possible spills on their land. But in this case, the court said there were proper consultations, calling them robust. The NEB did consider the potential impacts on the First Nations' rights, gave it a full opportunity to make its case, and even imposed conditions on Enbridge. In a statement today, Enbridge promised to foster a strengthened relationship with the Chippewas of the Thames and all Indigenous communities built upon openness, respect, and mutual trust which is how it should work going forward, says the Federal Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Resource companies know they've got to engage really early, like at the idea of a project. In a ceremony in London, Ontario today, the chief of the Chippewas at the Thames expressed his frustration and disappointment. But others say these rulings are a victory for Indigenous groups, that the highest court was clear today. It's not just companies that must consult. The federal government must make sure Indigenous views are heard. Susan Lund, CBC News, Ottawa. So how are other Indigenous people and their leaders feeling about today's Supreme Court rulings? The CBC's Karen Poles has that part of the story. Welcome to First Nations University. These students from the Fishing Lake First Nation are getting a tour, a recruiting mission to interest them in higher education. Students can take these classes as elective or students we do pursue a full degree in the Indian Arts. Indigenous leaders hope education will give young people a voice on issues like the environment. And while the concept of the duty to consult Indigenous people may be complicated, these students say from what they see... Canada's not listening enough. Instead of making decisions for what is good for right now and how it's going to affect seven generations down the line. Indigenous leaders are also having this discussion at a meeting of the Assembly of First Nations in Regina where, coincidentally, environmental issues were high on the agenda today. Ontario Regional Chief Isidore Day is disappointed the Supreme Court ruled against the Chippewa of the Thames. He says the current regulatory and approval process is flawed. We need a parallel process. Uh, you know, the, 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 the federal government has an agenda. 
these uh, these bodies are 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 pseudo. There there are uh, tribunals and and other processes that that are very much affixed to the government, and uh, they, they are they are loaded with uh, you know uh, biased positions. The AFN is still reviewing the court decision, but released a statement saying, it's clear today that our right to consultation and accommodation must be respected and upheld in the context of the standards set by the UN of free, prior and informed consent. For these students, environmental protection isn't about legalities or politics. It's much more personal. Swim in the lake. You like to swim? Yeah, and fish. Yeah. Go outside in, in the trees. Striking at the heart of who they are as Indigenous people and the responsibility they feel for the future. We need to preserve the land we have because we don't have anywhere else to do this or to live. It's something they want governments and resource companies to respect when they make decisions affecting the environment. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Regina. The First Nations University you saw there in Karen's story will be one of two places to see a federal funding boost announced today at the AFN General Assembly. We are building education systems across this country that are First Nations led. In that spirit, $3 million will go to the university and another $2 million for a pilot project on sustainable funding for Indigenous students. The death of a First Nations man who was pepper sprayed, tackled, beaten, handcuffed and stepped on by police has been deemed accidental by a coroner's inquest. What you're about to see here is difficult to watch. At a remote Northern Ontario nursing station in 2010, Romeo Wesley stopped breathing while he was held face down on the floor. The inquest has found that his cause of death was struggle and restraint as well as agitation and trauma with acute alcohol withdrawal. One of two men convicted in the Ontario Via Rail terror plot, Chiheb Esagayer, has been undergoing treatment for mental health issues and is now appealing his sentence. As a result of his treatment, he has come to understand the significance of the sentence imposed on him, which was a life sentence. Essegayer and another man were found guilty in 2015 on terror charges. Both were sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. An update for you tonight on the payroll mess that's left federal public servants without proper paychecks for months. Government officials had promised they would reimburse people for out-of-pocket expenses related to the Phoenix pay system, such as interest charges on credit cards or bank penalties from bounced checks. Well, from September until June, federal employees have made more than $680,000 in expense claims, but have been reimbursed only $110,000. Many claims are being denied. The Treasury Board of Canada says people are claiming expenses that don't qualify for reimbursement. Coming up, the defiant B.C. residents who refuse to flee the fires. That's what saved the house. Plus, we talk with Canada's new swimming star, Kylie Moss. Going to the States was a big option. So what made her stay here? Well, today Washington yet again proved to be a world capital shaped and reshaped 140 characters at a time. The U.S. president tweeted out a change to Pentagon policy banning transgender people from serving in the military. The response from Democrats was outrage from Republicans, mainly silence. As Lindsay Duncombe explains, it seemed to come out of nowhere. In the latest edition of Policy by Tweet, Donald Trump stepped right into America's cultural divisions, saying the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military, adding the forces cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Go. A recent study estimated there are between 1,300 and 6,600 transgender people serving in the military. Some estimates are higher. No one today could answer if those people will be out of a job or if the policy change applies only to new recruits. I just want what any other American citizen will be offered, dignity, respect and the ability to serve my country. 
This is all relatively new territory for the American military. The Obama administration allowed transgender people to openly serve just last year. We're ending the ban on transgender Americans in the United States military. Trump's Secretary of Defense had initiated a review of the policy which hasn't been completed. Although Trump credited the decision to advice from my generals, the Pentagon referred all questions back to the White House. Democrats on the Armed Services Committee say they asked for an update recently and no policy changes were mentioned. He tried to claim it was because of advice from the Pentagon, but that would be contrary to the testimony we heard last week. So we need to get to the bottom of who actually made this decision. So why the sudden move? There are reports it's all about the budget, that conservative House members were reluctant to free up cash for Trump's campaign promises, including the border wall, if public funds were used for gender reassignment surgery. Some conservatives did applaud Trump's decision. Right now, we have people who cannot serve in the military with asthma or with flat feet. So why would we allow uh, individuals to come in, although they're very patriotic and we appreciate their desire to serve, but who have these medical issues that could be very, very costly? How costly? A recent report suggests transition-related medical treatment could cost the military as much as $8.5 million a year. The military spends five times that on prescriptions for Viagra. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. The Canadian forces had its own response to the development south of the border today, tweeting out a picture of its members marching in the Toronto Pride Parade earlier this month. Along with the message, we welcome Canadians of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Among the dramas that are unfolding in Washington, the Republicans struggle to do something to undo the U.S. health care law known as Obamacare, which suffered another setback. On this vote, the yeas are 45, the nays are 55, the amendment is not agreed to. Since beginning debate this week, that's now 0 for 2 after a failed vote yesterday on a replacement for Obamacare. Today, a bill to repeal much of the law without immediately replacing it also failed. Up next, a so-called skinny repeal, which removes a few elements of Obamacare while leaving most of the law intact. Now, beyond the politicking in Washington, a fascinating health story recently unfolded here in Canada involving a baby with a life-threatening heart defect and a groundbreaking surgery before birth. Vicodopia has more. When Sebastian was born two months ago, he'd already had an operation on his tiny heart while he was still inside his mother, who was conscious throughout it. I don't recall a lot of it because it's just a lot to take in. Sebastian had a rare condition. The space between the upper and lower chamber of his heart was completely closed, restricting blood flow. He was okay while in the womb, but if he was born that way, a surgical team so would only have minutes the, the to fix has, the defect. So for the most metabolically active cells in the body, the cells of the brain and the heart, if you stop oxygen supply to them, you have three minutes before they start to die. To spare the baby and mother from that trauma, specialists from sick kids in Mount Sinai hospitals decided to do the surgery on Sebastian in the womb, sending a catheter through the amniotic sac. We pass it down through the needle, so this, the tip of the needle would be inside the baby's heart. The tiny balloon punched a small hole in Sebastian's heart wall to allow normal circulation. When Sebastian was delivered five days later, doctors were still afraid he might be oxygen deprived, but he wasn't. When he came out, he was pink and screaming, and it was just the most amazing sound I've ever heard, because I was expecting a little blue baby to come out. Follow-up surgeries went off without the usual urgency or risk of complications, thanks to the operation in the womb. I thought you were incredible. The surgeons finally met Sebastian for the first time since his operation two months ago. The team is one of just a few in the world that performs cardiac fetal surgeries, but never for Sebastian's type of defect. These specialized in utero surgeries sound risky, but in certain cases, it may be the only way to prevent life-altering complications at birth. And these kids can um, play soccer, play hockey, go to university, have pretty normal lives. And that's exactly the hope for Sebastian. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto.
At least one person died today amid a week-long last-ditch effort to derail the Venezuelan president's plans to change the country's constitution. A two-day strike escalated into clashes between protesters and police. It's become a deadly ritual on the streets of Caracas. Ever since Nicolas Maduro announced a vote to elect a body tasked with constitutional reform. The opposition believes the election is rigged and will move the country toward dictatorship. That vote is on Sunday. Today, three UN agencies declared that a staggering 80% of children in Yemen need urgent humanitarian assistance. The heads of the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the World Food Program said that two million children are malnourished amid a two-year civil war that's cratered the country's infrastructure. This after the Red Cross declared it's doubling its efforts in Yemen to combat a rapidly spreading outbreak of cholera. Straight ahead, when wildfires came, some BC residents stood their ground. Did their controversial choice pay off? Earth Day has been organized from this office by young people using all the enthusiasm and techniques of publicity which were developed by the peace movement. They have been joined by many politicians, for no one opposes in principle a clean environment. On Earth Day we're going to be focusing the whole society's concerns upon the broad range of environmental issues that are coming up to the whole series of ways that we are destroying the world that, that some of us really want to live in 30 years from now. All we are saying is given the chance. They gathered in thousands here and tens of thousands there, but in our 136 countries, there were 200 million, the organizers said. But who could possibly count? In Europe, they bicycled. In Central America, they rallied. On Parliament Hill, there was a message from the man who wrote, Never Cry Wolf. With the help of the Wolf Pack, I want you to pick up that message and bounce it off this building behind me. Now, let's go! Arr! There may have been snow in the forecast and a cold wind blowing, but the drums were hot in Ottawa, even if the crowd was smaller than expected. No, there's a lot of issues at forcing this thing maybe to the back seat, but I don't know, I still think it's pretty strong. In Montreal, there was a march through the city. It's important to remember people, we are losing our hearth now. In Toronto, hundreds took part in an Earth Day march, walking from Queen's Park to Toronto City Hall. Here too, organizers admit the fight to clean up the planet is not easy, but it must be done. Although the environment is under great stress, we at least can show some hope. Earth Day sucks, there I said it, Earth Day sucks. He's not alone, there's a growing group online. It's not the message, that, Norman says, is good, especially when it involves educating the young about the mess their parents have left the planet in. Now he sees corporations using Earth Day to sell stuff, and he doesn't pull punches. Earth Day should be every day. This one day per year stuff is garbage. All we are saying is give us a chance. Well, it turns out nature wasn't behind all the wildfires in B.C. The one in Lake Country was deliberately set. Eight homes were destroyed, another 30 were damaged, and 300 people were forced out of the community. The RCMP say they have opened a criminal arson investigation but have no suspects. They're asking anyone who was in the area on July 14th or 15th, and especially anyone who took video or photographs on those days, to come forward. Residents of Williams Lake are anxiously waiting for the all clear so they can return to their homes. They've been out of that community for 11 days now. But local officials say the fire situation has to be stable enough to lift the evacuation order. And the town has to be ready for an influx of people. The CBC's Aaron Collins was allowed into the community today to see those preparations. The streets of Williams Lake are deserted. Almost. 
but a week and a half into this evacuation, preparations are underway for more than 10,000 people to come back home. Staff at this supermarket have been scrubbing and stocking around the clock, preparing to reopen. A job made more difficult when their fridges and freezers failed. Uh, you didn't have to go a foot in the door and you smelt bad things. It's unclear when exactly their customers will be back, but it's certain that the grocery store will be one of their first stops. And uh, it's, uh, it's so important for everybody to have food. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's comfort. More than 150 wildfires are still active across BC's interior. Several are burning beyond the hills that surround Williams Lake. Now, how those fires behave will determine when residents can come home. Okay, so the fire, the fire ended up seven kilometers from the city border right here. 11 days after the evacuation, Williams Lake remains blanketed in smoke, but key infrastructure is back online. Well, we are ready. The city is ready. We don't want people to come home and then if, if things get worse, then have to evacuate again. That uncertainty means cleaning up isn't the only worry for business owners hoping to reopen. Not only do they need food to serve, they need to be sure they'll have staff to prepare it. I mean, they have families, my, some of my staff, and they're, they want to be sure that they're safe. And um, I'm, I'll probably lose a few staff. Getting back to business is the first step towards getting back to normal, something that should happen quickly. So far, at least, Williams Lake has lost no lives and no homes due to these wildfires. Oh. It would be great. Yeah, it would uh, It'd be really nice just to open the doors and just kind of let it roll again. These streets will fill up again sooner rather than later, but officials warn that this summer, people will have to be prepared to leave again. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Williams Lake, British Columbia. Now, most people under evacuation orders in B.C. heeded them and got out, but not everyone. This summer, some people stayed to try to protect their properties. They stayed despite intense pressure from authorities and despite the very real risks. The CBC's Briar Stewart has been driving along BC's Highway 20, stopping at five places to talk to those who made the controversial choice to stay behind and fight the fires. Beyond the roadblock surrounding Williams Lake lies a highway lined with now blackened trees. Few stray animals left wandering after being turned loose as the fire roared in. This was the scene at Chicolton Towing in Risky Creek on July 15th. The fire was still 100 yards back in the bush, but there was fire starting out here and out in the field. This is what it looks like now. 35 cars destroyed along with one barn, but not the home because the owner and his relatives stayed to try to protect it. There was a couple fire guys uh, from Terrace. They were here. They uh, had it. Well, we helped them set up some tanks here and uh, got the sprinklers going on the roof. And, no, that's what saved the house. There were some buildings that were destroyed. This is all that's left of the restaurant and gas station in nearby Hansville. But many feel the damage throughout the area could have been much worse if it weren't for the residents and crews fighting to protect their communities. Here on Unicitine First Nation, Jordan Bobby may still be in training, but he was on the front line when the fire threatened the reserve. Yeah, it was pretty chaotic. I didn't expect that to happen all so quick. Other crews were on site too, including firefighters with the province. At one point, they say things got so bad that many of the others pulled back to a safety zone, but they stayed. We knew we weren't really in danger, but uh, it's a smoke burn out our eyes. While flames licked some of the homes here, nothing was destroyed. I grew up around this community and really look forward to trying to help out where any way I can. And that seems to be the sentiment down the highway at Anaheim First Nation. Alongside the local fire crews who have stayed here are volunteers. That's done. They're working in a stifling hot kitchen for hours a day, preparing food for the firefighters and others who remained. We're just the cooks in here. And we've been here since day one. Because of these roadblocks, you can't even get through to go get groceries or whatever that you need. Food has been donated and delivered to the communities along this highway, including here inside Del Del. This is our Chesapeake fire here. It hasn't been evacuated, but Chief Irvin Charlie Boy says yeah. they have been taking care of evacuees from other communities. We put them up in the 
school gym down here and feeding them out of here and it's been busy that way. The band runs a logging company, but some of its employees are now being used on the fire line north of the community. While a few crews are in the field, the chief is frustrated because he believes the First Nations firefighters could be used even more. I mean, it doesn't matter while you're on reserve land or you're a reserve firefighter, you're an experienced firefighter, you should be kept on the fire. Charlie Boy says the First Nations are meeting with BC forestry officials. Given how hot and dry this fire season is expected to be, he believes his team will likely have plenty of opportunities to fight more fires this summer. Briar Stewart, CBC News, near Seidel, Del, BC. Southern Europe is dealing with its own fires. In Portugal, firefighters are battling a number of wildfires, including this one near the town of Massau. Ten villages have been evacuated and more than 75,000 hectares have burned so far. The country is going through a serious drought and is experiencing fierce winds. And along France's Riviera, thousands of tourists and locals alike have been forced out by wildfires. Firefighters backed by water bombers and helicopters are trying to contain the blaze, but some homes and buildings have been destroyed. Coming up, dogs are more than man's best friend. They don't care where they are. They don't know where they are. They don't know that this is a prison. A women's prison in BC uses doggy daycare to help rehabilitation. But first, another medal for Kylie Moss. We ask how it feels to be among the best in the world. The game is Space War and is played on a computer. At the moment, it provides esoteric sport for young mathematicians at MIT. Someday it may train them to fight a war in space. Whether it's the nice zingy sound they make, the electronic challenge, or just the thrill of controlling what happens on a television screen, TV games are exerting a powerful fascination. What do you think of the game you're playing? I love it. These students at the University of Alberta in Edmonton have developed a series of games that can be played on the computer. The idea of the game is to manipulate the cursor towards your enemy until you get him in the center. And once you've got him there, bang and he's dead. Defender, Asteroids, Missile Command, the names of some of the arcade hits that are attracting millions of video addicts every day. Video junkies have a current favorite. Someone even wrote a song about Pac-Man. Pac-Man grossed more money in arcades last year than the movie Star Wars, one of the most successful Hollywood films. These are not games you would find in an arcade. They are the latest generation of home video. And this is where the real boom in the industry is occurring. I don't play that much. They're really addicted to this thing. This is a story about a game. A game some say is so exciting, so enthralling, so much fun, that if you ever start playing, you won't be able to stop. Your fingers flying over buttons as you jump, fly, crush, and kill your way through an alternate reality. Alluring, fascinating, compelling. A curse. They're video games, the flashy, trashy offshoots of the computer revolution. Its programmers say we haven't seen anything yet. The first, the best known, the sex change operation was one performed about 15 years ago on a young ex-GI named George Jorgensen who went to Copenhagen and came back as Christine. When Christine's story was told around the world, there were applications from hundreds of young men who wanted to undergo the same kind of operation. Well, Diana, now that you're officially a woman, how does it feel? I feel absolutely marvelous, thank you. Did you always want to be a woman? As long as I can remember, sir, yes. And now that you are, uh, how does it, what do you miss most about being a man? I never was really in, in intensity a man. Um, 
or psychologically, so I miss nothing about my malehood. Lee Davis of Ottawa was born a woman. Recently, after a number of medical operations, Lee Davies became a man. I was only a kid. I felt different. I mean, I knew I wasn't, my body wasn't what my mind was saying I was. My mind was totally male. Caroline's surgery 17 years ago gave her the woman's body she dreamt of and a model's salary of $200,000 a year. No one questioned her femininity. In fact, she modeled for seven years before the British tabloids made her story public. She even played a Bond girl in a 007 film. It's only the British government that doesn't accept the change. I'm sort of classified still as a man. I mean, I break the law every day if I use the woman's toilet. I mean, I can't really use the, the men's. I mean, if I committed a crime, I'd be in a men's prison. That's Kylie Moss leading Canada's team to a bronze medal finish today at the Swimming World Championships in Budapest. That was for the 4 by 100 meter medley relay. But it was yesterday that Moss swam into the global spotlight. Moss getting on top. We'll watch the clock as well. It's Moss, Moss set a world up. record in the women's 100 meter backstroke, becoming the first female Canadian swimmer ever to win a world title. Her time of 58.10 seconds broke the longest standing record in women's swimming from eight years ago. Moss also became the first Canadian to win any world championship in swimming since Brent Hayden claimed gold in the men's 100 free 10 years ago. Kelly Moss, 20 years of age. It all builds on her first international splash, Olympic bronze in Rio for that same 100 meter backstroke. Earlier today, I spoke with Canada's newest swimming star from Budapest. Hey Kylie, you know it seems like only yesterday you and I were chatting in Rio after you won the bronze there. So congratulations on the bronze today and mega congrats for yesterday. How are you feeling? Thank you very much. Um, it's been pretty crazy, quite a whirlwind, but um, it's been really fun. You know, on yesterday's race, uh, you know when you hit that that last kick headed for the finish line in the 100. Mm -hmm. Did you know you were in third place? Like, mm -hmm. what was going through your mind at that point? Um, yeah, no, I didn't know at all where I was uh, after the 50, but um, I know I have a pretty strong second 50, and I think that's one of my stronger qualities in my races. So um, I was just really trying to build that last 50 and that last 15 meters into the finish. And, and so when you looked up at the board, we all saw your face. Um, what was going through your mind when you saw the result and the world record? Yeah, um, honestly, I don't even know. I had to make sure I was looking at the right name and the right time, but um, I was just super excited and I, I still, I feel like it's still surreal and it hasn't really sunk in yet, but um, yeah, <laughs> super happy. <laughs> I bet. Um, you know, I remember how excited you were in Rio last year and I wonder what the experience of winning a medal at the Olympics has meant to you in the months since then as you've trained for these worlds. Yeah, um, a lot. I think it really helped me get to where I am, where I was yesterday and where I am today. Um, it really gave me a lot of confidence in Rio and just um, being able to, to trust in the whole process and my coaches and all the training that I had done leading up to that. Um, I think that those are all good lessons to, to keep in mind leading up to any championship meet. So um, coming into this, um, I often looked back on uh, that experience and kind of told myself, you know, it's the same thing. Just you know, swim your your two lengths backstroke and then um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Well put. Um, you know, I, I I think one of the reasons people here are extra thrilled for you is that. You go to school and you train right here in Canada at the University of Toronto, right? I mean, there's a strong temptation for all athletes in this country to go to 
you know, all elite mm -hmm. athletes go to one of the big U.S. athletic universities, yet you chose to stay here. Uh -huh. uh, so I wonder what went into your thinking on that decision. Um, it took a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, I live in LaSalle, close to the border, so going to the States was, um, you know, a, a big option and a lot of swimmers from my area had done that. So um, I looked into both Canada and United States, but um, decided that U of T would be the best fit for me. I was gonna be the most comfortable and I could pursue both academics and athletics um, like I wanted to. So um, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> Man, it sure has, it's worked out. Um, and I, I wonder too what you think your success um, means for the Canadian University athletic system. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really just, um, shows that, I mean, anything can happen and, you know, you work hard and listen to your coaches and, you know, you do all those proper things and, um, yeah, really anything can happen. And, you know, it, well, I've got you, you know, so many, as we said last year, we, we talked about this in Rio, right? Uh, many young Canadian women are swimming so well these days and young men, mm -hmm. but what do you say yeah. to girls and for that matter, boys out there watching tonight who dream of one day being able to swim for their country. Yeah, the same thing as I just said, honestly, just keep working hard and make sure I think the most important thing is to have fun with it all. Um, for me, that's kind of, I mean, I love being on the University of Toronto team, um, being able to train with a group of individuals who all have the same goals and I mean, swimming and school, um, it makes it better day in and day out. So honestly, just have fun with it and uh, keep working hard. And Kylie, before I let you go, I want to—I mean, anything you want to say to your friends or family back home watching in LaSalle? Uh, thank you so much for all your support. Um, I've seen all the messages and stuff, and I haven't quite gotten back to everyone, but um, I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Kylie, and congratulations again. Up next, a BC prison for women tries to teach inmates to care about others by letting them care for dogs. This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Between Jasper and Red Pass, a start is made. All the latest weapons employed by engineers in modern pipeline construction converge on the theaters of war. The enemy, one by one, toppling to echoing cries of timber. And the steel monsters arrive. To 140 sidings from Edmonton to Vancouver, 5,000 railway flat cars bring their loads of pipes and then to their individual prearranged spots in the continuous chain. They're linked together by a complicated process that assures 100% accuracy. The pipe is 24 inches in diameter and every inch of it must be evenly coated. And then check and recheck. Then a wrapping is added, made from glass, felt, and asbestos, as the men observe their finished product laid to rest. A continuous tube, liquid railway, stretching 718 miles. The big question is, of course, whether there is life on Mars, and the short answer is that it's not impossible. No one knows what Mars really looks like, but this week, streaming back from deep space is the best information in history, bringing us nearer the answers concerning the origin of life, whether man is something special or a special freak. The search for life on Mars is still continuing. Data received from the Viking landers have puzzled NASA scientists, and within the past two days, they've been able to confirm that the ice caps of Mars are really frozen water, not carbon dioxide as once believed. So the chances of finding life get better with each passing day. Its past was hostile and torn by meteors. Its present is cold and barren. A colony here would seem a futile fantasy. But today's dreamers are scientists, and they do their dreaming for NASA. I think the possibility of Mars as a second home for mankind is very important for our future as a race. The students are building a prototype Martian colony called Marsville. 
It's on Earth, but they do understand what it will take to settle on Mars. The temperature on Mars is a lot colder than on Earth. And these students understand cooperation is the only way to get to Mars. I mean, with all of the technology they have now, we could have somebody go up pretty soon. They've come from all over the world for this meeting of the International Mars Society. They've got bumper stickers. They've got a Martian flag already picked out. The one question that always comes up is this. Is it worth the many billions more to put people on the surface of the red planet rather than just machines? The Mars fans here admit the barriers are huge, but they also say we have the capability and the money to get to Mars. All we need now is the will to do it. To find out more, we need to go out into space, and space research, like politics, is the art of the possible. What we would like to do must be weighed against what we can do. I know it looks bizarre, like I'm not supposed to have a good time, but that's why we're, we, that's why this is here, is to help us cope with what we've done. What they've done is criminal, in some cases violent, but at one women's prison in British Columbia, well-behaved inmates are being given a special opportunity to work at a dog daycare. The program is supposed to help with their rehabilitation by allowing them to experience love and empathy and to learn valuable work skills. But it's actually doing much more than that. As Chris Brown first told us last fall, the dogs are giving these inmates a second chance. Behind the high fences and the razor wire, no digging. At the women's prison in Abbotsford, BC, a group of dogs are having the time of their lives. It's gonna be one of those really messy days for us in here. The Fraser Valley Institution, which houses women who've committed some of the most severe and violent crimes possible, is one of five federal women's prisons in Canada. Our CBC crew was allowed to spend the day there recently, on the inside, nice. to experience a one-of-a-kind in Canada dog daycare program. It's a kennel inside a prison where people from Abbotsford drop off their pets. Well, I always said if I went home with clean clothes all day, I hadn't done my job properly. So <laughs> and have prisoners go. look after them. Inmates such as Ellen Dennett. You want to jump on top of him like that? Hey. The wire pens to contain the dogs and the barbed wire around the institution to contain the women invite a comparison, says Dennett. Let's go get a bath. It also forges a bond between the animals and the inmates who care for them. They love you. They'll hang out with you. They know you're coming. You're going to be here to play. Oh, she's going to feed me. And that is extremely important because they don't care where they are. They don't know where they are. They don't know that this is a prison. Ready? Ready. Go get it. Alicia Santella runs this program. She has an office in the prison, but she works for the Langley Animal Protection Society. She believes deeply that dogs can help with rehabilitation. Well, the women really understand what it's like to be locked up, what it's like to not have control over your environment, um, the anxiety about that. So they are really good caregivers. And it's one of the beauty, uh, beautiful pieces of working with dogs is that the dogs don't judge the women uh, for what they're here for, for their histories. They judge them on how they handle them today. Still, many of the women here, including Dennett, were convicted of terrible, violent crimes. Seeing them spend the day caring for pets and enjoying the experience may not seem like especially harsh punishment. And I think anyone that hasn't worked with dogs um, or, or live animals might see it that way. Uh, anyone who has had an opportunity to work in a kennel or work with live animals understands just how much work goes into that. And I, and I feel like it's a really valuable uh, program for training people to have really good work ethics and really good work skills. The goal is to foster responsibility and nurturing in the prisoners. Caring for dogs can help people become more empathetic, something correction staff want to see as prisoners prepare to reintegrate after their sentence. My full parole is 2021. <laughs> 
Um, but I'm hoping that um, that I continue to do well and get me out of here on 2018. Ellen Dennett's good behavior earned her a place in this program, but many would still see her crime as unforgivable. She was convicted of second-degree murder. But five years into her sentence, she insists she's not the same person as back then. This is what I think probably this is the one thing that's been changing my life around. Because they don't look at, at me as an inmate. They don't know of the horrible crime that I did. They don't know that. And that makes all the difference in the world to me because they don't have a clue. Okay, Chilka, let's go. The dogs may not know, but their owners definitely do. And having prisoners interact with them is also part of this program. No, hang on. It's rare that Canadian prisoners get to meet and talk to members of the public while serving their sentences. Uh, I think he wants to go home. But this program gives them a chance to do that. Twice a day, when the pets are dropped off and picked up, inmates walk right into the prison's entrance lobby. Brushed out, smelling nice. And meet with the owners. On the day we visited, Janine Luce came by to pick up Chilco, a dog with his own troubled past. Luce says Chilco was rescued from a shelter. He got a second chance, and I, I don't know, sometimes I, I feel like rescue dogs know they've they've been given a second chance and they behave accordingly. That's just me, but I've read other people say the same thing. And the, the ladies that are here, they're also working towards a second chance. And, it, and I think maybe they have a bond, something in common that they, that they might share. And we're gonna give them a little brush down. Ellen Dennett is eligible for day parole in 2018. She says this program has helped her understand the harm she's caused to the family of her victim and her own family. I just want them to know that I've come a long way. I've had trouble dealing with it. And I wasn't in the state of mind that I am in now. And just to come in here every day and take care of these guys, it gets me through the guilt the grieving, the humiliation of my family. I know it looks bizarre, like we're not supposed to have a good time, that we're not supposed to laugh or, you know, with the, with the dogs, but that's why we're, we, that's why this is here, is to help us cope with what we've done and to get ourselves back on track and try to move on to whatever life I have left. Our brief time at the Fraser Valley Institution offered just a glimpse of life on the inside and a reminder, second chances are also part of the criminal justice system. The dogs who visit here may provide some inmates with that. Chris Brown, CBC News in Abbotsford. For more than half a century, a mystery has lingered in a New Brunswick forest. Today, a solution that's even more intriguing. That's coming up. But first, let's check today's business numbers. The TSX dropped 30 points, no change to the dollar. Some record highs in New York for both the Dow and the NASDAQ. The price of oil climbed 86 cents a barrel. This afternoon in St. John's, Newfoundland, a young man named Terry Fox started running. Many people have run or walked across Canada but Fox hopes to be the first to do it with an artificial leg. I got a lot of positive attitude and I think I can do it. He calls his running style the Foxtrot. After 25 days in Newfoundland, Terry had raised $25,000. That song was commissioned by the Cancer Society, which had its own doubts when he started off. Now, as he pounds out the kilometers, the money pours in. Most of it in cash. He's got all the guts in the world. And I wish him all the luck in the world, too. And I hope he makes it. What do you think of Terry Fox? I think he's great. He'll make it. He'll make it. The run to City Hall, down University Avenue, took Terry by hundreds of people. It was an emotional moment for many of them. I knew I was going to make 20 miles. But when people were out there like that, it was incredible today. We've seen him surrounded by crowds of supporters. But the crowds go home. Terry keeps running. I'm stubborn and competitive, and I, I don't know, I, I really enjoy life. I enjoy challenges. I don't like people feeling sorry for me. I don't like pity. 
and I wanted to show these other people what I could do. The National with Norton Nash. Good evening. A story of incredible courage came to an end today. At a news conference. Yesterday I was running, and I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing. And I, had to, I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that the cancer had spread. And now I've got cancer in my lungs. And uh... From one end of the country to the other, there has been a spontaneous outpouring of support for Terry Fox and cancer research. Rarely, if ever, have so many people been so deeply moved by one individual. If it comes to the point where I'm told I'm going to die of cancer, I haven't got a chance, I've got to be able to face that. And Good evening. Terry Fox died this morning in a British Columbia hospital, one month before his 23rd birthday. Well, he was a very brave boy, I must say, and I feel very, very sad about it. Don't cry, love. It's all right. Don't cry, sweetie. It's all right. I think he touched the hearts of a lot of Canadians, and they all really look up to him. More than our sympathy, we would like you to express as well our profound gratitude for the gift which Terry gave to all of us the gift of his own boundless courage and hope. Canadians everywhere walked and jogged and ran to raise money for the fight against cancer. He accomplished more in a few short months than most of us can hope for in a lifetime. at first thought it might be a small aircraft that had crashed, but there was uh, no sign of any aircraft parts or anything around. Well, it's something that the people in Lutz Mountain, New Brunswick have never forgotten. The day this mysterious white box fell out of the sky into a tree, and then moments later, it was suspiciously whisked away by the Canadian military. Now, 55 years later, the mystery of what's officially known as that thing in the woods has been solved. Turns out that thing is actually an American spy camera. According to recently declassified documents from the CIA, it was mounted on a balloon and used to secretly photograph Soviet Russia. Conservation officers in Ontario and Quebec have been secretly working to save an endangered plant from poachers. Wild American ginseng is a hot commodity. A single root, as small as my finger, can be sold for hundreds of dollars. Larger ones go for thousands. Over the years, ginseng thieves have taken so much of it, the plant is now on the brink of extinction. Alison Crawford has more on the story. Dubois means from the wood, and if anyone has lived up to that name, it's Jean-Francois Dubois. Most weekends you can find him in Ottawa area forests, looking to identify and protect one of Canada's most endangered plants. Before I found my first one, I've looked for at least five or six years. Just almost, walking through the bush? Yeah, almost every weekend. Fourteen years ago, Dubois found what he was looking for. Oh my god, almost like winning the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> it was such, such a, a moment for me. Uh, so many emotions when I first saw it because I've read so much about it. Oh, there's a nice one. Another tree. Oh, you can see the fruit on it. Yeah, exactly. And this is good news. When you see fruits, it means that maybe there's a chance that there's going to be a small one growing in a year and a half. Dubois, a botanist, discovered this small patch of wild American ginseng in 2011. His guess is there are around 50 plants in this spot, not enough to survive in the long run. Sadly, if it doesn't have uh, the minimum number of plants, 170, uh, usually the population have a tendency to uh, go down in size and eventually disappear. While ginseng is on the brink of extinction, Dubois says there are only two dozen viable populations left in Canada. This is our ivory. This is our rhino horns. In Canada, of course, it's a plant. It doesn't bleed. It doesn't cry. But it's it's danger of extinction here in Canada. We have to do something. Trade in wild American ginseng started 300 years ago. Settlers in New France traded it almost as much as fur. Over time, the market expanded. 
long used in traditional Chinese medicine, physicians found the plant helps with digestion and nervousness. While ginseng's value depends on its size and shape, a root the size of a man's finger can fetch more than $500. I got to get some ginseng quick. So I went to a holler that I've never been to before, and sure enough, I hit a jackpot. While ginseng poaching is the focus of two cable TV shows in the United States, ginseng thieves are also at it in Canada, and that's why Dubois' discoveries are now protected under constant surveillance by conservation officers. So welcome to our evidence room. Okay. Everything here has been seized at one point right. and has uh, been served as the evidence in court. Among all these contraband pelts, tusks and skins taken from well-known endangered animals people love and revere is also a seized root of ginseng. Wildlife crime is actually one of the largest forms of crime out there. It's the fourth largest after illegal drugs and human trafficking and corruption. But when it comes to the illegal harvesting of wild ginseng, offenders are getting off with suspended sentences and fines. In Canada, and generally speaking around the world, penalties for environmental laws are quite low compared to other kinds of uh, crimes, mainly because people don't see a human victim there. But Dubois sees a human victim. Wild ginseng may well have unknown medicinal properties that would disappear with the plants if they become extinct. It's why he continues to explore the woods for more wild ginseng to protect. Allison Crawford, CBC News, in an Ottawa area forest. Well, everyone loves a good bargain, but now even the most style-conscious consumers are starting to question the real cost of fashion. A new social movement called Conscious Consumption is gaining popularity here and around the world. And as Diane Buckner reports, Canadian entrepreneurs are cashing in on the trend. It's worn just nicely enough. That Twin sisters, Lindsay and Alexandra LaRusso, are inspired by what other people throw away. Their Toronto-based startup company makes new children's clothing out of old cast-offs. We're looking for adult sizes, maybe extra large to large even, because the more room in them, the more fabric for us. The bigger, the better. Nudnik is their brand, and repurposing stuff is in their blood. Their father founded a waste management company, Wasteco, 40 years ago. But the big idea came when we understood how large textile waste was globally. Textile waste. In North America alone, 26 billion pounds of clothing is discarded annually. Only 15% is recycled. So much gets trashed that some Canadian municipalities are working to have textiles banned from landfills. More and more countries are taking action on the problem too, which is created in part by fast fashion giants that feed consumers' desires for trendy, inexpensive clothing. Even despite the best efforts of the industry over the last 20 to 30 years to clean up its act, and there's some, been some great initiatives, and I'm afraid the situation in the fashion sector is that things are getting worse, not better, simply because people are buying more all of the time. And that's a really, really big problem. Another factor driving that overconsumption is social media. After you post your outfit on your Instagram page, people won't like to wear it again. Um, that's the unfortunate reality of our society. And I Natalie like Festa myself. has launched a new company called Boro. We have about 250 garments here right now. It offers a less expensive wears, and more eco-friendly way to pump up a wardrobe by connecting lenders and borrowers of high-quality designer fashion. It's quite easy to see that using a service such as Boro has a much better environmental footprint. There's a growing number of Canadian startup companies focused on so-called ethical fashion, using natural fibres, paying a living wage to workers in other countries that make the clothing. We're part of a community of people that are really striving to create meaningful products for people that do last and stand the test of time. But there's no denying that the excess of the fashion world is a towering problem to tackle. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, last week's charity scandal out of Newfoundland has been resolved. An epic game of chase the ace with a jackpot over a million dollars suddenly had to be stopped when duplicate tickets were discovered. Turns out it was a printing error. Tonight, with proper tickets in the hands of all players, the game continued and somebody won. 
but not the big prize. Courtney Noseworthy had the winning ticket, but failed to draw the ace of spades. Still, she seemed happy with $172,000 as a consolation prize. I kept reading the ticket, and I'm like, no, this is not right, not at all, but it is, so. <laughs> the game now continues into week 42, and that jackpot grows just a little bit more. <laughs> That's the National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Paul Hunter. Good night.